should go up first, if that's possible. Thanks very much. So um, just to let you know, if you were here this morning and I couldn't find the clicker, there's a big white sticker here that says clicker, clicker, clicker. So now there's no way I can't see the big green button. Yeah. So um, you're very welcome to the business session this, uh, this afternoon. I'm starting very, very much on time because we have 45 minutes. Uh, which is not a long time, but we would like to give uh, a, lo a lot of time afterwards. And of course, there's the poster session and the reception that you'd all like to go to, um, to the output session, which comes on at 4.45 and transitions straight through. Mm -hmm. So um, we will be quick. The clicker is here. Does it work? Yes. Okay. So you think so I've had a lot of people say to me, what's the business? Session about Hillary. So, just to, uh, we distinguish uh, for various reasons two things, two parts to RDA. So, the work of RDA, which is what the most of you are doing here, you're the volunteer community, um, and you do it through the working and the interest groups and the mechanisms that we have, yes? And the business of RDA is everything that's around that to ensure that the work of RDA has. Uh, the platform and the facilities to do that. Okay, so we're talking here in this in this case about the the business, if you like, of RDA, and we would view this as a little bit. I mean, you heard me, if those of you who were here this morning about the consensus and the openness, and if you think of this around the lines of you know speaking to your shareholders and giving them an update on what you've been doing um, in, since we saw each other the last time. Okay. So um, just a quick reminder as well about the organizational body, so with the structure, if you like, around RDA. So uh, if you look at the gray, that's the individual and the organizational membership are there, and everything else lies on top, of course, the working and the interest groups. And then we have a technical advisory board, which provides social technical vision and strategy, an organizational advisory board representing, of course, the organizational assembly, who are our organizational members, and they provide advice on needs, adoption, and business. And we have a council um, with the, who provides the organizational vision and strategy, okay? And down the side there running, I see operational body, so the secretariat, which is the administrative and operational um, leg, if you like, or arm, um, to, 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 to the RDA. Hmm? So I will uh, very quickly give you an, uh, an update, some very quick highlights from the secretariat. Ingrid, uh, who is the RDA council co-chair, uh, will, uh, with Ross Wilkinson, of course, will give an, uh, a quick update on council. Then Francoise Genova, uh, on behalf of herself and Paul Euler, will uh, give you an insights into the technical advisory board. And Kevin Ashley, on behalf of himself and Eamon Nuremberger, as the co-chairs of the organizational advisory board representing the assembly. I'd like to keep the time fairly quickly on this because, as I said, it's like speaking to your shareholders, so we'd like to keep 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, ask us anything that you like, and then we'll transition immediately to the output session. Hmm? So, Secretariat. There we are. There are quite a number of lovely faces and pictures there. So, just to let you know, these are all the uh, wonderful people who work on the Ordia Secretariat um, uh, from all over. Uh, Europe, uh, America, and Australia, and they all, you can see them there, but it's very hard to see their titles and things, but uh, they all have a very specific skills, very specific roles on the Secretariat and provide humongous support. Uh, one of the things that they're doing at the moment is uh, focusing very much in the Secretariat is on the adoption, and this kind of summarizes very briefly uh, the, the the current strategy from the Secretariat about adoption. So there are three aims, to enhance the findability and the intelligibility of the outputs, supporting adoption through education and training, and monitoring adoption stories and impact. And I talked a lot about impact this morning. It is essential. We're six years here, we've got these 30 outputs. Uh, we have many, many adoption uh, cases and stories, and we want very much to try and capture them and turn them into also impactful uh, stories and, 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 and measures for, for ourselves, but also for you. Um, how are they doing that? Well, here at the plenary, you see they have two boffs running. So I've given you the times, the rooms, 
um, and the days. So please, if you're able to 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 attend, I'd be uh, we'd, the, we'd be very grateful if you did to give your insights. There are webinars and trainings that are being organized and will continue to run. And then there's a whole share your adoption stories uh, activity going on. There's a poster session and, and many things about that. What I would like to say to you is um, in the next session, there's going to be, and this is a, a run against the clock, a 20 minute presentation of the 30 outputs that we have in a nutshell by Anthony Juni that the task force have put together. And I've heard it. And I really like it and I really hope. I think it's wonderful to see it all together, so please uh, stay on and listen to that. One brief thing, you know, we have a code of conduct uh, policy in RDA, and um, we have a process, and I wanted to highlight that um, it's important for a, 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 um, a community of this size to have a, a, a code of conduct, um, and also for the physical, but the virtual and platform. So all the details are on the website. There are for four of us who are first points of contact, but you may um, approach anybody that you feel comfortable to do if you wish to report something. And indeed, we will. you can see the uh, process that's there on the website. So click on About, go to Code of Conduct, and uh, everything uh, is, is there for you. Very quickly about Finland, but I think I put the wrong slide in. There it is. So I want to give you a couple of highlights. You'll hear a lot about it on Friday or Thursday, um, but just to make sure in case any of you are leaving, the theme is data makes the difference. Um, by the way, we're so inundated with co-located events that we've actually already opened the call for co-located events, and it's open now, and you are very much invited to make your submissions to, to that until the 20th of May. It'll be a three-day event this, uh, this time, so this is two and a half, it's three-day, and why? Because we're putting a half-day unconference component into the, uh, into the conference, which we feel is a very important component to uh, get your ideas for future activities, maybe inside your RDA, maybe in other ways, okay? So um, check out the updates on us there and you'll get the link to the co-located events uh, from that. I think finally, this is my last very quick highlight. We have done a lot of work, Council has done a lot of work on the value of RDA for different stakeholders. You can, if you go on the website, on the homepage, you'll see them there, the seven that are available now. We would be very, they're living documents, by the way, and living pieces of work so we're happy to update them if you have ideas and also I've already, we've already had a request for two or three others and we're happy to we'll be working on those again and if you would like to contact me or any of my colleagues on the secretariat um, we all receive inquiries at rdalliance-alliance.org so please contact us then and that's me for the secretariat I pass to Ingrid for council thank you very much So thanks very much, Hilary. Um, I see that my slide deck is not what I expected it to be, so that's very interesting. So let's see what happens if I... That's it, thank you very much. So um, we had a very interesting all day long um, council meeting um, two days ago. And here you see a nice picture of that meeting because you will probably think that it was really a boring board meeting, but you can see that we had our moments of laughter here. Um, I would like to highlight three of the um, elements that we discussed in that meeting. And the first one is future plans for plenaries. Um, we have had 13 plenaries up till now, and um, the concept of those plenaries has been all more or less the same over the years. But of course, that concept is not carved in stone. And we think that the moment is right now to um, re-evaluate that format. Um, because we see that the community grows, the community changes, and also the world in which RDA is navigating is changing. So um, it looks like the right time to look again at the frequency of plenaries, but also at the structure of them and see whether we can introduce new elements, etc., etc. We will also be thinking about the co-located events. We will be thinking about maybe giving more visibility to the regions. Um, so this is one item on the agenda that we're going to dig in further. The second item that I would like to highlight is the regional engagement. And this is not a new topic, as you may know. Um, we um, spend some time on that also in Botswana. 
we had a task force working on um, giving more structure to uh, the engagement between RDA Global and the different regions. And um, the work of that task force in which the regions were represented led to a kind of framework document that is now being used in um, the negotiations and the discussions with the different regions to come to more structure and also to think about the mutual um, advantages for both sides. So this is ongoing work and tomorrow we will again have a meeting of that task force. Final issue that I would like to highlight is um, the um, re-evaluation of membership. Um, we think that is the right time to again look at the different membership categories that we have within RDA. And this is inspired on the one hand by the fact that we have this regional engagement um, movement that of course touches upon um, the organizational um, membership because these organizations are of course in the different regions. So we need to look at that. But another incentive to look at this is of course um, the long-term sustainability of the RDA business. So what we plan to do is look again at the different membership categories the individual memberships, the organizational memberships, we have affiliate members, and now we will soon also have regions in RDA. So how do we mix that in the right way? And um, community involvement here is very important, of course. So we will involve the community in, um, um, by consulting all of you about this. Also, of course, the organizational assembly and um, there is a strong involvement here of the organizational um, board. So this work is starting off and will be um, continued in the, in the next month. And you see here on, this, on the screen, help wanted community input. I think for all of these items, also for the, the future form of plenaries, it's very important that we get your input and we will work on ways to consult you um, online and offline um, for all of these topics. So, and then the final point that I like to touch upon is um, the council elections. You have heard uh, already about that um, this morning and you can also see it on the website. Um, when you are a council member, you become a council member for three years and there is one possibility um, to be re-elected. So the maximum time that you can serve is six years. And here you see the nine council members that we have at present. Um, but um, the time has come in this plenary for three of the council members to um, step down. And you can see them here. The first is Jean-Bernard Minster, and unfortunately he isn't here um, um, at this plenary. Um, he has served on the board for three years. And then we have Fran Berman and Ross Wilkinson, who in, in, um, my, uh, for my feeling have been here always, and that is really true because they were even before RDA was really um, in place with its first plenary. They have served for six years, and it's really so that the seeds from which RDA um, has developed is um, a result of their collective minds. So I see them very much not that as the founding fathers, but maybe as the founding parents of this organization. They really built it, and we have put them already in the spotlight, as you can see on, on the photographs here. Uh, but that was in a smaller context of, of council. Um, so I would really um, like to ask all of you, I would like to ask Fran and Ross to stand up, and I would like all of you to give them a big hand for all the fantastic work that they have done. Thank you, thank you very much. Without you, the organization wouldn't be what it is today. So that leaves three um, empty seats in council and, and big shoes to fill, but we had an excellent nomination committee that came up with a number of wonderful new candidates for council, and you see them here on the slide. Jill Benn from Australia, the University of Western Australia, Bob Hainish in the room here, um, whom most of you will probably know, who has been around for quite a long time, um, director of the Office of Data and Informatics at NIST in the US, and Mark Leggett, who was already here on stage this morning, Executive Director of Research Data Canada. So we would very much like to have your opinion on this slate. And what do you need to do to let us know that? Um, it's quite simple. You need to go to the RDA website, and there you find a revolving banner on the home page. 
But before you click on that, you need to make sure that you are logged into the website. That's very important because if you aren't, you get the information, but you can't vote. So first log in, then go to um, the website where you can find the elections and click on accept or reject. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, I am representing the TAB. I am one of the two TAB co-chairs, Françoise Genova from Strasbourg in France. And we have a new co-chair in TAB, who is Paul Ullier, who is here from the USA. Uh, we have currently 14 members, and next time we will be 15 when there is the next election, because the council has been wise enough to give us the possibility to have three more people on progressively on three years to, to do the numerous tasks we have to do. So we have uh, new members who joined us at the end of last year. Uh, Christine Kirkpatrick, Isabelle Persei, Raed Sharif, Frankie Stevens, and Dimitris Koureas, who had already been with us for a few months and who was elected at that time. Can the TAB members please stand up? who are in, in the room. I am sorry if you had your computer on your knees, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, the activities, so it's only a very brief uh, report on the activities. As the people who propose groups know, we evaluate group proposals, so we had a burst linked uh, to the fact that we had a plenary which is good, and we evaluated six groups. One of them is uh, accepted, and the others are working again on their case statements, and I guess we will see them again soon uh, with updated case statements. Uh, we had uh, also a burst of activity, like every time we have a plenary, because as the people who propose sessions know, TAB evaluates the session proposals, and many of you, if you have proposed a session, you may have a dialogue with a member of TAB about the content of the session, the way the proposal was written, and so on. All that to improve uh, the cases for sessions so that the people who attend the plenaries know uh, how to choose where they will go. So thank you very much to everybody for their willingness to cooperate to do that. Uh, to, to improve everything for the sake of the community. Uh, Andrew uh, Trelor, who was our outgoing chair, has now the task to schedule the session. He did that the last time also. And so we do the first scheduling of all the parallel sessions, and then the secretariat is doing the scheduling management after the, chairs, the session, session proposals are aware of uh, when they get their sessions. Uh, Andrew has also prepared with his both uh, hats on TAB and OAB the pathways which are being tested this time to help you to choose the sessions you will attend. We have been uh, discussing a lot around the unconference uh, concept and so we will see what happens on Friday and on Thursday, sorry, and we will debrief the day after. And we also had to choose the topics for the TAP chair meeting. So we are doing evaluations, but we are also doing liaison with groups and with the community. So we have the new members of the TAB have got their share of the liaison, and they will probably get more soon, because we want to help them to get in touch faster with the community than waiting for people to leave TAB. Uh, so you may have, if you are a, a chair of a group, you may see your liaison changing, but it's for this reason. And we also want to clarify the state status of working groups, which are uh, older than they should be, and see what happens to them and to, to help them to choose their new status. We had a, a good tab chair meeting yesterday, a discussion around the life cycle of groups, around success stories, uh, and we also got summary of outputs, adoption activities. You will see more during the two buffs. 
and there is also a task force on web, on the web. I think uh, everybody has things to say about the RDA web, and there are people who are working hard to improve it. So there is a task force on that. Uh, if you want to know what we do on a regular basis, we have a monthly activity report, which is posted below at, on the bottom of the tab public page. So you can see what we do. It's updated every month with what we have done the month before. So what we will do until next plenary, we will be beginning by debriefing this plenary. We begin on Sunday, but of course, it will last for longer than that. We will update the liaison. We will continue to evaluate group proposals. There are many boffs, and I hope there will be groups propos group proposals coming out of the boffs. So we will see, crossing fingers, and hoping you will do the work, as usual. Uh, we will be involved in the discussions about the possible evolution of the plenaries. We will, as usual, work on improving processes and documentation. First, we understand we have to document how to close a group. This is a result of the discussion yesterday with the chairs and again working on the old working groups. There are questions we will certainly discuss on the impacts of the RDA. There are many aspects to that which are listed on the slide. And also the West Task Force is working on classification of groups and we will have to, to have a look at this and to understand how to use it at best. Thank you. Thanks for that, Francois. Yeah, I'm having the technology pointed out to me. Now, my name's uh, Kevin Ashley. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Organisational Advisory Board, uh, along with my colleague, Amy Norberger. Um, we're just going to very briefly uh, explain um, so which of these? Green, big green button. Big green button. <laughs> Point of that up. <laughs> Maybe it needs my magic touch. I think it does. No. Ah, there we are. <laughs> so I'm going to very briefly explain, particularly for those of you new to this, quite <coughs> what we are and where we fit into the organization of RDA, say a little about what we're doing, and then remind you why it is that we as organizations uh, even choose to do this. So Amy and I are co-chairs of this thing called the Organisational Advisory Board. It means we get the chance to work uh, with, with individuals like this. Some of these uh, names will be familiar uh, to, to many of you. Uh, and we're one of the bodies, uh, as a result of that, that the co-chairs get a seat on RDA Council. We get the chance uh, to, uh, to shape and to input the, the, the strategy uh, and the taxes of what RDA does. But we're representing uh, a larger group uh, called the Organisational Assembly. These are organisations that have chosen to pay a subscription fee uh, to, to act as, as a support to, to, to what IDA does. Uh, there's, there's more than 40 of those uh, at the moment, along with, with a few uh, affiliates, 48 in fact, uh, at the moment. They're the logos. I'm not going to attempt to go through them in the time available. I hope you can see there's a good deal of variety geographically and uh, in the types of organisations, not so much in the colours they use for their logos, but that's a, a, a separate issue. So one of the things uh, that, that, well, I say we did, uh, we had an idea uh, that was suggested by one of our members about a year ago, uh, and uh, as senior people in organizations often do, we then asked some other people to go away and do something about that, which, uh, which was to have what were originally called swim lanes, now called pathways, things to help new people in particular find their way uh, through the program. It was tested out in Haberoni Tab. Andrew Trelaw in particular did a lot of work in that for which we're very grateful. Uh, it's been uh, shared more widely this time. One of the things we, well, RDA in general, would like to do is to get some feedback on whether you found this useful, whether we should be continuing to do this in the future, and indeed who should take responsibility for it. And you will be hearing, uh, I think, after this in the communications you'll get after the plenary about uh, means uh, to get feedback, uh, which, which uh, I've been in particular, my colleague Amy has done some work uh, to, to, to be able to do that. So please do respond to that. Let us know, was it good, was it bad? Did you not even notice uh, we were doing it? Amongst the other things uh, we've been up to is working uh, with others again on TAB to provide adoptability guidelines. The idea that we want to ensure that groups uh, are given a clear message when they're setting up 
in the middle of their work, towards the end of their work, about what does it take to make an output adoptable? What sort of information do you need to be able to provide to allow somebody else to make a rational decision on should I invest some effort in understanding whether I can, I, I can use this? And we hope that's going to, to build up the case for adoption that we're going to be hearing more about uh, later on. We've had the chance to shape some of those value statements uh, that you heard about uh, earlier, uh, and we've been inputting uh, into the future your RDA strategy, in particular issues around sustainability. We care about that. We as organizations primarily decided to subscribe to this because as organizations, it's good for us that something like RDA exists. It helps us do our own jobs better, and therefore we want that organization to be able to continue, either in the same way uh, or, or in different ways. And although we do get these benefits that I've talked about and access to council, primarily I think most of us will want to pay that fees even without that, just because RDA helps us do our jobs better. That's all. We'll be around to take any questions that anyone has if you had them later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're all amazing. You're kept to time. So now we have this uh, moment until <clears throat> 445 for questions. Any burning questions? Anything you'd like to know about that you didn't hear about? Anything that you'd like to know about that you did hear about? Oh, it's all clear. <laughs> so, oh, please, there are microphones in the middle if you'd uh, use them. And if you wouldn't mind telling us who you are, it's always nice to know. Uh, uh, Gerhard Goldbeck from Cambridge in the UK uh, and the European Materials Modeling Council. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm interested in your sustainability um, discussions and whether you can share any, anything further how you can sustain the organization in the medium to longer term. Mm -hmm. Who would like, would, <laughs> will I answer that? So it's a very complex question, but so part of the sustainability strategy is what Ingrid mentioned before about regional engagement because um, the Research Data Alliance is, is funded, you know, uh, regionally, so in the US, and then there's a central part. Um, clearly that, so there are two, uh, a couple of different pieces of work going on. There's the discussions and the negotiations with the regional, if you like, uh, partners and the, the future there. The regional engagement, which by the way is um, openly available in one of the groups. So if you look for the, uh, under the coordination groups on the website, you'll see we have a framework there on um, what regional engagement could look like. Um, and there are some you know, um, figures and things like that. Uh, obviously that's one of the, of, the, of the major strategies also to understand how regions who are not currently involved in a significant way uh, could become involved and become uh, closer engaged with us. I think that the regional engagement, if I could say this, is if you see the, the member statistics, if, if any of you have seen them and where we are, um, it's very clear that the Northern Hemisphere is, is much more represented. And that's because there have been big programs there. So we would like to support and hope that that could happen also in other regions around the world. So uh, that's really where the regional engagement uh, focus is and then um, obviously the organizational uh, membership is a very important uh, form of, of income as well for the for the alliance would any of you like to add to that or is that a succinct add, question uh, a little, I mean I, I think uh, in, in various discussions uh, there's no green button there there's no switch <laughs> um, First discussion, there have been different analogies used, I think, for what has been that, that it's a child that's now grown into a young adult, or that earlier we were trying to, to essentially nurture what was a startup that's now grown to something sustainable. And all of these, I think, just point to the fact that the, the structures, the support structures, the, the financial models you may need to set up in those early stages of the child or the startup or whatever aren't necessarily appropriate in the long term. And that's the type of thinking we're trying to give to, to say it's not that what we had in the past was wrong. It was right for what we did, and indeed it's given us what we, we have now. But to reconsider which of those things need to, to continue and which don't. And things like 
what membership means and, and what membership models are are part of that, mm -hmm. uh, as well as looking at diversifying sources of funding uh, and, and also thinking what infrastructure the organization itself needs uh, in order to support the type of activities that we want. Happy with that? Good. So yeah, go and have a look at the RDA regions. Um, and you, by the way, you're free to comment. So again, log in, but please uh, leave points about it if you, and join up to the group so you understand what is, what's going on. You're all happy. You just want us to roll on to the adoption and the outputs, don't you? So, um, well, that's fine. I think we could do that. If, that's, if you really don't want any, I think it would be nice to give more time. That doesn't mean, Anthony, you can speak for an hour now, okay? <laughs> Only Julia's allowed to do that. <laughs> okay, well, then I'd like to thank the uh, my colleagues and the organizational members, for, uh, body members for for taking the time to give you the insights. If you have any questions, please do let us know. Um, and I will hand over to the, so we have a task force, as I told you, on the uh, secretariat that looks, has been focusing on adoption. It's a kind of a combination between act efforts that were going on in Europe and the US, and they join forces for the global good, which is wonderful. So uh, Daniel Bangart, uh, Anthony Juni, and unfortunately, Marika Williams, Williams isn't with us, but the three of them have done a lot of work and they've put together the session that you'll now um, uh, be a party to. Okay, so just bear with us a second while we turn around the, the people on the stage. Thanks very much. All right. Let's see. All right. So, evening as everyone. Uh, as Hillary said, there's a lot of information to cover. So, the aim today uh, is to introduce you to uh, a number of the outputs that we have within the RDA and how they can be implemented uh, across the research data lifecycle. Uh, as Hillary mentioned, uh, this work is not uh, is certainly a team effort within the secretary. I'd certainly like to uh, give a note to Daniel Banger and Marika William, uh, Williams, who couldn't be here. Um, but uh, please, if you see any of us around, grab our elbow, ask us questions. We would love to talk to you all day uh, about the outputs and what we're doing within the Secretariat and how they could be applicable within your own work, but I'll do my best to uh, get through these really quickly. So, green button. It works. Okay, so again, I'm going to offer a brief overview of the RDA outputs. This will be pretty high level, uh, and then the aim would be to have We'll have a panel uh, moderated by Daniel uh, with uh, working group co-chairs and adopters, uh, which they'll bounce off one another, describing their protocols and processes for implementing the output, how the output came to be, uh, and describe some of the benefits and lessons learned throughout that implementation process. Uh, also, we'll describe some uh, ongoing secretary activities, which you can engage in here during the plenary, uh, uh, within those boffs and within the webinar, and also online for those that are joining us by GoToMeeting and then we'd really love to hear your questions and answers. That's the whole plan of being here at a plenary is to engage with you all. So please don't hesitate. There's mics here. We'd love to hear from you. So let's revisit again what our mission is as an organization. We build the social and technical bridges that enable open data sharing. So enable, in order to enable social and technical, those uh, outputs have to bridge uh, multiple epistemic, cultural, uh, cognitive, uh, domain and infrastructure and data uh, settings. And uh, so within the infrastructure and data side, we uh, those outputs address uh, issues surrounding data discovery, provenance, reuse, and interconnection, issues of scale, governing and maintaining infrastructure and data access and interoperability. But then think about the people and social and cultural practices that are actually working with that data. You think about issues of preservation and stewardship, improving the usefulness of data, data sharing culture in general, uh, education and training to build that capacity and knowledge for everybody that's working with that data, and then data security, legal interoperability, and compliance. 
So uh, researchers and innovators uh, openly share data across technologies, disciplines, and countries. This means, again, this uh, has to be global across domains, and it has to apply to multiple different epistemic ways of which you think about data. So, but much like you might have noticed already throughout your interactions with people here within the community, this is not solely the job of individual researchers. Uh, this work uh, and this way in which we think about outputs is uh, ap applicable to, say, lawyers, uh, individuals uh, working within the publishing space, uh, governors and policy practitioners. All of you and we all have the responsibility to understand how these best practices, recommendations, and outputs can be implemented within our own spaces. You all have the power to advocate for them in your own unique ways. So my aim here is to try and communicate that to you so that you can leave with some of that knowledge of how this could fit into your own workflow. So, Going back to workflow, we've talked about who, is, who might be involved in this and, and sort of the overall why, the mission and vision. Now let's talk about what we aim to implement and how we aim to implement it. So that means we'll implement it at individual spaces of this research workflow. So the aim today is I'll, I'll offer you some insights into data management outputs that can be implemented within that data management space, uh, uh, processes that can be implementable, implemented within uh, data collection protocols, uh, ways in which you can enhance the description of your own data, ways in which you can identify, store, and preserve your data, as well as ways in which we've uh, created outputs and recommendations for the dissemination, publishing, linking, and finding of data, as well as some of those social uh, recommendations and best practices uh, for policy, legal compliance, and capacity building. So let's start with data management. Exposing data management plans Currently within most of your work, some of the data management plans that govern data across sites or within a, a single institution are often static objects, uh, which are one-off, they're developed one time, and they're, they sit there for ages for everybody to look at. But the aim would be, as a data uh, project evolves over time, how might you make that uh, data management plan machine readable and uh, scalable to be edited throughout time and version controlled and make it more transparent uh, for everybody within that project so that it's more machine readable. So a group here has uh, developed ways in which uh, you can expose data management plans so that they are machine readable, easily editable and version controlled by multiple people on the same team and more transparent across sites so that everybody can in a sense be on the same page for how to manage data and do so in a machine readable way. Now, that seems like a relatively high bar, but uh, we have outputs here that are relatively really low bar and easy to use uh, and a very easy entry barrier uh, for, for use. Uh, one of those that has been very widely adopted and, and translated in over 11 languages is the 23 things for librarians. So this, as you can see, is, is not in English, but it's been translated multiple times, as I mentioned, into, into 11 different languages. And one thing that is really just a quick and easy way to get librarians involved Many of you in this room might yourselves be librarians. I feel lucky every time I get to interact with a librarian and learn from you. You are incredibly valuable in this space and incredibly valuable to this organization. And uh, outputs like these are, are certainly representative of, of that value and impact of that work. So let's move on. You've thought about how you want to manage your data, and now you want to move into collecting some of that data. Now, uh, another very low entry bar for, for a quick and easy output that's pretty relatively easy to use is the 11 quick tips for finding data. So what are the ways in which you should start thinking about discovering new data, searching for data, querying data? This uh, output offers a very quick and low bar uh, for uh, ways in which and best, uh, ways in which and recommendations for thinking about finding data. Again, start where you're comfortable, grow from there, and then you might find outputs that, that can be applicable uh, at later stages of your research workflow. Now, one of those might be the scalable dynamic data citation uh, output. This has been adopted by multiple institutions in multiple spaces from uh, the Deep Carbon Observatory to paleobiology to electronic health records. And, and a quick, in a quick snapshot, the, the way in which to think about this is that uh, you have a data set that's constantly growing in volume, velocity, and variety. The, if a researcher wants to query that at a particular time and point and create a data set, they want to make sure that they can take a quick snapshot 
and uh, make sure that that time and space in which that data was created is citable. So this allows you to run a query against an evolving data set, create a DOI for that query itself, create a DOI for the data itself, and then create some very clean metadata that you can use in that citation. So whenever you go and publish your research product as a result of that, uh, pub of a, as, that is based on that data that you use within your analyses, you can then turn that over to another researcher who can use that query ID, use that query DOI, or use uh, that data DOI, quickly execute it, re-execute it, reproduce the same data, and also have the option of making additional alterations and creating a new subset of data based upon that data citation that you shared in your publication. So uh, if you'd like to learn more, there's some links here in the slides that uh, give a, a bit more executive summary of how this output, output could be used. Uh, now, you've collected some data, now you need to actually describe that data in a bit more detail. One crucial element, which uh, I'm certain all of you recognize, is uh, the metadata standards that you use for describing your data. Uh, how do you know which metadata standard is applicable? How do you even begin uh, touching on the experts that might know where, uh, what metadata is useful and applicable? Uh, the metadata directory is one, uh, one tool and output that's usable for finding the metadata standard that's applicable. The elements that might be used to describe individual elements within your data, as well as ways in which you can crosswalk against metadata, uh, cross metadata standards uh, to improve the robustness of your data description. Now, within uh, sensor data particularly, but uh, across multiple different middle layers of, of, of high performance computing, uh, identifying the type and format of a data type is incredibly important in order to allow algorithms and middle layers of high performance computing to, to activate uh, efficiently and effectively. So it's really crucial to quickly identify the type of data that you might be pulling from a, data, from a sensor, identify the form of sensor that might have created that data, and then and, uh, continue to run it through a particular algorithm and have decisions based upon that data type. So the data type registry, uh, there's, two new ver there's a new version and a, a previous version. It's a, uh, essentially a repository of data types that can be queried in a middleware to uh, allow for quick identification of a particular data type and the format uh, and particular, uh, particular sensors that may have created that type of data. So uh, you may have, in addition to sensor type data, maybe you have some physical samples uh, that you might be working with within your own uh, research pipeline. So uh, RDA uh, and TADWIG created the metadata standards for attribution of physical and digital collections. Uh, this quickly allows you to differentiate between the physical object, the digital object, the agents which work upon those digital, digital and physical objects, and the processes that synthesize the digital object from that physical object uh, relatively uh, and, and identify those based upon this model. So it, it makes it easier to identify those different types of data, both the physical and the digital. So you now have some digital objects, you have some physical objects, you've described them, but now you need to uh, build some persistent identifiers, stir, store them, share them, and preserve them in some way. So as I uh, mentioned those digital objects, one crucial thing is there's really no common core model to describe all digital objects that might reside within a repository and the common core model that can scale and generalize to include the persistent identifier types that might identify those digital objects and the associated metadata. So uh, the Data Find Foundation and Terminology Working Group conducted interviews of 120 experts uh, and created five global, global reports and, and created uh, this uh, Data Foundation Terminology Model which is a very uh, high level review of what might be the best way for organizing digital objects in order to improve interoperability and improve the dis uh, distinguishability and findability based upon those persistent identifiers, the digital objects themselves, the metadata descriptions, and all the context and state information within that. Um, and this also enhances both the interoperability and the queryability of those findable uh, digital objects. So another working group output that's upcoming is the PID kernel information, which is uh, 
in addition to identifying the type of persistent identifiers that might identify those digital objects, the aim here within this output is to wrap within the persistent identifier some very base levels of metadata that make it easier to identify that, that particular persistent identifier and what other persistent identifiers might link to it, and in, in essence, build in some metadata within that persistent identifier itself and link it to associated uh, metadata and associated digital objects. So we've now identified our data. It's hopefully stored relatively well. We have our core model of all of our digital objects. Now what we aim to do is we want to make this more shareable, maybe link across other sources, and then improve the findability of all those digital objects across metadata repositories and other uh, data, digital object repositories. So, WDS and RDA uh, created a data publishing workflow which allows uh, uh, some general guidelines for how to publish uh, data publications and data sets and some core processes that are crucial within that publishing workflow, including what materials might be essential in order to uh, assess the quality of that code, that data, the metadata itself, who might be the agents that are involved within this process of publishing this data, what might be the relative checkpoints along this workflow. In addition to this, we've worked uh, within the uh, data publishing uh, standards and implementation interest group. Uh, they've worked with a number of different journals to create the journal publisher research data policy master framework, which is a maturity model of data sharing statements and the elements that ought to be within a data sharing statement within a, within a journal and associated information that ought to be archived within that publication in order to improve both the transparency of the data set itself, its associated linking across sites, and its findability. Over a thousand publication, uh, a thousand journals have signed on to some level of this maturity model, and they continue to be engaged with with uh, organizations throughout. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the Data Description Registry Interoperability uh, Group has recently released a publication, which I hope you all have the time to look into. Um, the aim here is to improve the ways in which you can uh, improve the linkability of publications based upon uh, authorship, associated grant IDs, or uh, any other associated collaboration IDs uh, within a repository. Uh, and create a metadata schema that is uh, interoperable across those different repositories to improve that linking and improve that sharing and findability of associated research outputs. Another highly related output to this aim of improving the linkability of publications, associated grant IDs, associated uh, research outputs, and all of the authors and agents that might be involved along this process is Scholix, which is open source and easily scalable to a, uh, an individual's reposit uh, individual repository needs and widely adaptable with uh, Dryad, Scopus, OpenAir, Crossref, and other similar repositories um, to improve that scalability and interoperability across those associated research outputs. Now, you've shared your data, you have a publication representing that data. Now, what are the legal policies that you might need to uh, know about in order to license your data, assign rights of reuse associated with that data? What other legal compliance might you want to think about? And one piece I'd really like to touch on I think is crucial here and one thing that RDA is really pushing forward is, is how do you improve the capacity through education of individuals to really understand these recommendations and outputs uh, both within low, uh, LMICs uh, and within our own institutions. So one uh, crucial policy uh, and regulatory practice is that there's really no common framework for what uh, justifies uh, certification of a trusted data repository. So uh, WDS and DSA and a number of different partners created Core Trust Seal, which has been widely adopted across multiple different repositories uh, and continues to be expanded. And you'll hear a bit more about that during our uh, panel today. Um, and uh, this has been widely adopted and serves as a common framework for how to look at uh, some of those policies that are machine readable and look at what justifies uh, an assessment of a trusted repository. 
In addition to this, the CoData and RDA Legal Interoperability Group uh, has created uh, an output for assessing the six main leading principles uh, for what makes, uh, what to think about when assessing the legal interoperability of your own data, how to think about uh, in, uh, balancing the legal interests of the reuse of that data, and key guidelines in, uh, in implementing those uh, most open, uh, open uh, practices as possible within legal interoperability. Now, so we've gone relatively quickly throughout the, the workflow, I, <laughs> very quickly. I appreciate it, um, and I hope this was of some use, but if uh, you'd like to talk about some of these in more detail, this was really to give you a, a quick overview of what our organization is doing, because I, I think we're doing a lot. It's, qu it's quite rough to, to fit it into 20 minutes, but I, I, I hope that this gives you an overview of just the diversity of outputs that we've created, the ways in which they can work in tandem with one an another, the way in which they can solve individual issues within a research workflow and work in tandem across a research workflow, as well as be implemented across different stakeholders. So please, if you're interested in learning more about individual outputs or how they might be used, do grab my arm. I'd love to sit and talk with you all day. Um, but <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we can't do that now. So what I would like to highlight is uh, this work Translating these theories, th this, these recommendations and these outputs is not doable without people and without actually building capacity and knowledge within organizations. And two uh, crucial uh, groups that I'd like to, uh, is uh, the CoData RDA Summer School, which is training people in how to implement such recommendations and outputs within their own workflows, as well as the education and training on handling research data interest group, which is active in, in thinking about how to educate people in, in how to use uh, such uh, outputs and recommendations. Again, that I wanted to offer a quick overview of what recommendations and outputs we have, but again, I would love to talk to you about what Secretary is actively doing in order to uh, enhance the findability and intelligibility of those outputs. So we're looking at how can we document metadata surrounding each of these outputs in a more granular and robust fashion, and potentially pull in metadata and uh, other data from Crossref or Datasite to see how these outputs are being used across different resources. We want to support the adoption through education and training, so we've ran, we've ran some webinars and we're continuing to do so and we hope that you will engage with those and give us your feedback on, on how they're uh, applicable to your own needs and as well as monitoring the adoption of uh, uh, the uh, monitoring adoption stories and impact of those stories so we have a number of metrics that we're looking at and uh, seeing how we can improve the robustness and representation of those metrics as well as trying to crowdsource adoption stories and improve the way in which those adoption stories are packaged so that they're more intelligible. Uh, so please engage us within our Birds of a Feather sessions. The RDA adoption uh, enhanced dissemination stories will really focus on that piece of how do we get adoption stories more uh, highlighted at a higher level? How do you yourself share your own adoption story? What, do you, what would you like to see an adoption story in to really learn what that process looked like? Making adoption, making RDA outputs and recommendations easier to adopt is really focused on what metadata might we need in order to build a metadata repository, associated repository of these outputs, what descriptors might we need within such a repository and how do we improve the description of these outputs as well as how might we best repackage some outputs to make them very quickly and intelligibly adoptable by diverse stakeholders or just how do we build quick glossy things for, for, for diverse stakeholders to understand what our outputs are and how our organization is, is developing them. So please do, if, uh, if you'd like to see some of the webinars that we've, we've uh, created and ran, there's some uh, links there as well. So um, you'll hear more about what Secretary, Secretary is doing at the end, and I hope you'll uh, ask some questions and offer us your feedback, but for the time being, uh, yeah, um, Hillary will, uh, I'll pass this off to Hillary to trans transfer some things over. Thank you. No, I don't want to say anything except I have to come back up and say that is just amazing. I think that he's our walking encyclopedia of the RDA outputs. 20 minutes and he's got amazing insight. So really, I know you were helped by others, but I saw this before. I, it's the first time he's done it for the community and I really wanted to give him a shout out to him, but everybody else as well. Um, we, you know, 
it's, 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 it's really good. What happens when we get to 50 outputs, I don't know, <laughs> but we'll keep it at 30 for the moment. Thanks. We're working and creating new ones. Yeah, please. thanks so much, Anthony. It's so appreciated. Thanks so much, Anthony. I'm Daniel Bengert, I'm based at the Göttingen State University Library. So thanks for the shout out to libraries, Anthony. Um, I'd like to invite now a panel that we've um, asked to talk about their recent and upcoming outputs and also to give um, adopters a chance to talk about their experience. So this will be more discussion oriented and we hope to take some questions from the floor as well. So could I invite the panelists to, to come up, please? Okay, so the format for this section will be, we'll have three lightning talks by our working group co-chairs, um, giving a, a very brief overview of their outputs, and then we'll pose some questions to the panel as a whole. So to introduce them, uh, starting here with uh, Sophie Hugo, the co-chair of the Agri-Semantics Working Group. Sophie works at the Scientific and Technical Information Department of INRA, the French National Institute for Agricultural Research with a specialization on semantics and text mining. Currently, she is responsible for de developing services for vocabulary management and information analysis for researchers. Uh, Esther Tzade is head of unit in the Department of Scientific and Technical Information at INRA. Esther's roles at RDA have included co-chair of the Wheat Data Interoperability Working Group and co-chair of the interest group on agricultural data. Jonathan Petters is co-chair of the WDS, WDS RDA Assessment of Data Fitness for Use Working Group. As data management consultant and curation services coordinator in the university libraries, Jonathan provides research data management planning, training, and curation support to researchers across Virginia Tech. Rory Edmonds joined the World Data System International Program Office in 2012 and as Program Officer and became Acting Executive Director in June 2018. He was a co-chair of the working group that developed the core trustworthy data repositories requirements, which form the basis of the Core Trust SEAL certification standard. He is now an ex officio member of the Core Trust SEAL board and one of the leaders of the Secretariat. Uh, then we have Beth Playl, co-chair of the PID Kernel Information Working Group. She is currently a professor of informatics and computing at Indiana University in Bloomington. She has been on assignment since fall 2017 at the National Science Foundation, where she is working on open science. And we have Tobias Weigel, who is a computer scientist in the area of earth science data infrastructures at the German Climate Commu Computing Center. He's involved in building digital services for data management and analytics for the Global Earth System Grid Federation, the European Data Infrastructure, and the European Open Science Cloud. Could we welcome our panelists and give them a hand? Okay, I'd like to now invite Sophie. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm going to present the uh, outputs of the Agri-Semantics Working Group. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So semantics is everywhere, and it's so natural when you speak, talk, and read or paint. But semantics is not accessible to machines, so we need to formally describe, for instance, how a rice plant is constituted, how it grows and interacts with its environment, how humans grow it, cook it, how it is processed by human body, and et cetera, et cetera. In order to efficiently search, uh, process, analyze uh, research data and information, uh, we need to achieve semantic interoperability. This is when one is programmatically able to know if uh, similar items 
uh, from this thing that data sets actually refer to the same object of the world. And this is really crucial to open science and transdisciplinary research, um, what agriculture uh, research uh, tends to be. So to reach this, uh, we need shared controlled vocabularies and taxonomies to name things, thesaurize to index and classify documents and data sets, and ontology to structure and allow rezoning on data. And up to now, the agriculture and food domain, semantics uh, have been adopted, but to a limited extent and in an unorganized manner. Uh, we could say that we are still in the age of pioneers. So in the agri-semantics working group, uh, we've spent a year or so analyzing the situation and figuring out the limitations and bottlenecks for wider adoption. And after two years of work, um, we ended up with 39 recommendations addressing four types of stakeholders in order to facilitate the uptake of semantics by our community. So first, um, funders and software, please listen. We urgently need a free framework to get rid of processing chains for creating, uh, well, get rid of haddock uh, processing chains for creating and using semantic resources. Uh, Non-semantic experts like uh, data managers and data scientists uh, would gain autonomy. Uh, this framework should be generic, but highly adaptable to different skills, tasks, and domains. And it should be connected to repositories of trust in offering high quality semantic resources. In addition, uh, we need to improve alignment tools and use alignment standards. And to reach this goal, it is time to implement state-of-the-art algorithms to production tools usable by anyone working on connecting data. Third, we in the agriculture and food community want to collectively adopt better practices and engage in the implementation of fair principles and any other relevant um, standards met metadata and protocols, uh, PIDs, citation, etc. All went on and shared by the RDA community. Impacts on uh, findability, trust, and then reuse of uh, data are expected. Last but not least, um, we need to train more people in the data change on semantics technology if we want these technologies to be integrated into mainstream tools and be part of the researcher's environment. But this is not specific to our community, and we um, need to connect and um, uh, use RDA uh, to connect with application developer communities, infrastructures, in order to transform our recommendations into concrete implementations. We have exciting uh, scientific issues and use cases with high impact on society to help conceive and test your systems. So use RDA plenaries, uh, visit our poster here in this plenary, visit our web page and read our deliverables uh, to discover works and get in touch. Green button. Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's a good start. All right, so I'm Jonathan Petters uh, talking about the WDS RDA uh, assessment of data physics for use working group and how we're wrapping up our work uh, for that and the, the uh, outputs that we have generated. So, the, the challenge that we were given uh, about two years ago, a little over two years ago now, was to uh, try and figure out a process by which we can assess data sets and see how good they are, how fit for use they are, how fit for, for, for different purposes they are. So the first step in doing this was to specify some criteria of data set reusability. What, what criteria might we be concerned about when we're trying to talk about data sets being fit for use? So developing those first and then trying to develop some process by which a repository or a data provider could assess data holdings for reusability and say something about the quality of those data sets for, for their reuse. So that's why we've been working on it for the last couple of years. Uh, the solution, the thing we've come up with, uh, is a checklist for evaluation of data sets for fitness for use. 
There is a lot of overlap with FAIR data for the FAIR principles, but not entirely. There's some extra, extra things we, we talked about around uh, data co correctness, data completeness, curation levels applied, uh, a few other things. But there's a good deal of overlap. Currently, we have this in a Google form that'll be linked in the slides. I assume people will get a copy of the slides. It's in our uh, working group folder as well. Uh, this is, as I said, for repositories to use. And we have also designed this as a, a core trust seal repository, uh, as repository certification add-on. So the idea is that with this kind of certification process, the way we've worked it and designed it, uh, would be for core trust seal certified repositories because the core trust seal says something that that repository has gotten this certification, says something about its data holdings as a whole, that the data set holdings are findable, that they're accessible, uh, and, and some other things. So we didn't have to like start from uh, ground zero, we have a foundation to start from. A nice certification process that's getting, getting, more, and more, uh, getting more and more used. So design is an add-on to that process. <clears throat> and I should say, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say we've solved this problem. It's a thorny problem. We have made a lot of strides. But we have, uh, one thing we've learned a lot is uh, there are a lot of caveats to our solution. Uh, there are many. Core trust seal certification goes a long way towards providing for data reuse, and that's great, so we're building off of, off of that. But there are many caveats to this. Uh, the process we've developed so far is a manual approach. In the future, of course, we want to automate as much as possible. Right now, it's manual, so we're talking about using it for a sample of data sets uh, to, to analyze a sample of data sets within a repository. We're doing this for domains. Domain expertise is important. So the domain expertise of an evaluator, whether it's a core trust seal uh, a reviewer or a repository manager, is going to matter, and it's going to matter greatly. Uh, and we, we know that the data user perspective is really important here. It's not just all about the data providers. What's the data user trying to use the data for? What values do they bring? What experience do they bring? What knowledge is really important? We just, we just kind of threw that away because like, eh, this is hard enough as it is. And one thing we learned in our, in, our, in our travels the last couple of years, we talked to some domain repositories about, hey, we have this process. What do you think about this? And they're like, well, we don't yet have standards we've agreed upon for metadata or for data reusability. So how are we going to evaluate that? That's something that some communities have got resolved, some of them do not. So there's a lot of things we'll need to work on uh, going forward. Uh, one great thing is, is that uh, this work is being rolled into some future projects. Uh, one of them, the working group, Fair Data, Ma data and Maturity Model Working Group, which is, uh, I believe, tomorrow? I believe it's tomorrow, yes. And uh, the Ferris Fair project coming out of the EU is going to also pull in some of our work here. So although we, we haven't gotten, we, we still need further refinement, we're, our work is being carried on in other ways. So, very good. That's all I got to say. Great, great. Hi, Beth Pleli, uh, discussing the PID Kernel Information Working Group. So we began uh, fall 2016 with a with a basically a 12 month uh, plan on the notion that you could embed a tiny bit of metadata into a handle and that metadata would travel with the handle and be accessible without having to go to something like a metadata repository. So when one resolved a, a handle, it takes you to, when you click on a, on a handle in your browser or whatever, it will take you to a resolver, a local resolver, and that local resolver stores that small amount of metadata. So the first thing the group did is divide into, not divide into, but make sure we had represented in the room both the consumer perspective, those that are trying to find data, and the producer perspective, those that are having to get IDs, persistent IDs for their data, and we, and we had that, we had, we had good representation. We undertook for about six months the process of defining what these attributes might be, and Anthony's slide showed you the, a straw man of what these attributes these, the small number of attributes, and there are 12 attributes, uh, would look like. Uh, we included information in there such as provenance, which is, which is novel. Again, we were six months into the process, we had a 12-month timeline, and we realized that what we were lacking was a set of principles. So we spent the next six months developing a set of principles that underlie 
why something should be included in this small amount of metadata, the PID kernel information, and why it should not be. So I'll just read off a couple of these that'll, that should be, should be de uh, descriptive enough. There's seven. Uh, the primary purpose of the PID kernel information record is to serve machine actionable services, not human people at browsers. The PID kernel information is non-authoritative, so in other words, that the metadata has to reside somewhere else, so it's not going to be authoritative source for metadata. Uh, the PID kernel information is stored directly at the resolving service and not referenced so as to make that information instantly available. And we, we made it a principle on, who, you know, the, the chain, record chain can be changed only by the data object owner or their delegate. So I think these, these principles, I think, are, are, um, are, are valuable. So, so again, six months on the straw man principle, six months on the, um, or six months on the straw man attribute, and the straw man declaration of these 12 attributes, and six months on the principles. The recommendation reflects both of those. Um, it also illustrates um, architectural considerations and demonstrates the use case. Um, I think it's been a, it's been a, I think a worthwhile exercise. I think it needs follow-on activity. Again, we 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 made a 12-month commitment, and we were con we were sticking with that 12-month commitment. I think we laid a groundwork for follow-on activity that I think could be rich. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Now we'll um, open up the panel for some discussion. Uh, we just have some short questions we'd like to get some responses to and then we can also take questions. So to start with, if I can pose this to the working group chairs to start. Um, what is the value of working with RDA for your community? Could you talk about the needs and benefits um, of working within RDA and its processes? Sophie? Yes, um, uh, agricultural and food organizations are uh, intensive users of uh, IT and uh, software, but um, their mission is not to uh, develop them entirely. So um, we, we, we want to be involved in uh, the development of uh, those tools and infrastructures. And uh, um, RDA really uh, is, um, truly an inter international arena to check for latest advancements, uh, gain uh, inspiration and validate our ongoing approaches. Um, specifically for the agri-semantics uh, working group, um, RDA um, uh, allows us to um, gather uh, semantic experts and um, uh, specialists of agriculture and food and have them discuss together, um, share ideas, uh, and this was really uh, interesting during um, plenary uh, breakout sessions. And also to gather people with uh, different profiles, uh, IT researchers, um, policy makers, uh, librarians, and so on. So. Uh, we, we, we were able to um, investigate, investigate uh, locally inside our community um, our um, difficulties and uh, possible solutions. And uh, now we are um, on the way to, um, we want to discuss this uh, more globally, um, uh, get out of uh, our uh, domain and, uh, and turn to discussions with the other um, disciplines and uh, people who can offer uh, solutions to us. Okay. All right, so, um, ah, that's better. <clears throat> so uh, uh, assessing data fitnesses, data fitness for use. I think uh, there's a lot, there's a clear need for this. Uh, uh, you know, as a researcher, if I'm trying to find data sets, that are gonna be useful for me. I don't want to spend hours and hours screwing around with data sets that in the end I find, oh, they're, they're not gonna work for what I'm trying to do. So if there's some way we can shortcut this for researchers so they can make, make better use of their time, that's something that's certainly uh, something we all like to accomplish. Uh, if you want to see all of the efforts that have sprung up in the last two years around trying to assess fairness for data, uh, go into the Fair Data Maturity Model Working Group, you'll see many. 
uh, this is certainly a, a space that a lot of people are working in now to try and uh, try and work on it. So we're so we're we. So clear need for this uh, in the in the research uh, sharing community. So what's uh, what's RDA uh, good for? What's what's this nice for? I think the the first place I'd start would be the the rigorous, rigorousness of the process. I think is really useful. Uh, you know, it, there was a case statement that was put in and was. Uh, undergone uh, quite a bit of review. Uh, having an external group of people look at this case statement, say, well, this is what we're going to try and accomplish in this amount of time, and having people ask detailed questions about, well, so how are you going to accomplish this? How, is your scope relevant? Can you, can you accomplish everything you're trying to do? Have you thought about these particular potential blind spots and what you're doing? I think this is a really useful process. Uh, having that, having uh, some sort of accountability towards the deadline, whether it's two years or 12 months, this is a you know, nice way to make sure things move along and progress as opposed to just talking and talking about things. Um, having a public comment period after our, our recommendation, we're just been completing drafting and hoping to have sent out for public comment soon and having the ability for everybody to ask questions about it before it is finalized. I think these are all good parts of, of, of a process. Uh, having a forum for continuing the work after, after our project's end, uh, ended. So our, our output needs further refinement, uh, but we're going to tie it off now and uh, continue, look, continue talking about how we move it ahead, but there are other forums within RDA to continue this work along uh, while we've made uh, great progress. And I think this is all, these are all good things. The last thing I want to add is the fact that people can join these groups after they've been developed. So this is different from like having a grant funded project. So I happened to join as an a, a interested participant in this group after it was formed. And I was just really, I thought it was a really interesting problem and it was one that was relevant to, to me in my repository management. And I got more and more involved. Uh, that was it's not always an opportunity. This is an opportunity here at RDA to do such a thing. And they also encouraged us to have some sort of uh, ge geographic diversity in our working group, which is, which is good. And you know, because anybody can join, uh, that encourages, potentially encourages more diversity in the discussions. So for all these reasons, I think this was really quite beneficial. Great. Uh, so the value of RDA for the PID Kernel Information Working Group, um, I think RDA has seen the value of persistent IDs for data for quite some time. Um, I think other other entities are are now starting to realize it in in the in the, in the mass and breadth that uh, that RDA has has had a handle on for quite some time. I think some of the early thinking that went on in the uh, data foundations and terminology working group, we saw the data model that Anthony put up, kind of made it clear of how persistent IDs, data, and metadata relate to one another, data and collections relate to one another. And I think that model, now I think that's pretty evident to many of us, but that model wasn't so obvious years ago. I think the data type registry filled in a gap for if you're going to put information in, in stick, stick metadata information in the, in the handle, how are you going to know what it says and interpret it in a machine interpretable way? Well, the, uh, the DTR um, provided a solution there, so made that possible. So, and then also, I think having the expertise in the room, um, Larry Lanham, shout out to CNRI, long time engagement, that gave the deep, deep expertise to allow the exploration of, this is a fairly small topic and explore it in detail, um, also made that possible. I agree with the short term um, uh, agenda. I mean, RDA was founded on these 12 to 18 month working groups that I think remain a strength of RDA because it does give a sprint mentality to the, uh, to, to, to the activity, some of the activity that's going on. And then finally, I think just get based on the ex expertise that, that shows up at RDA, it's the best place to bring, to build consensus. Excellent, thank you. And nice to hear that those principles of diversity and openness coming through in those responses. I think we can turn to the adopters now and I'd like to ask them to share their experiences, um, in particular, firstly, around the impact of working with RDA recommendations and outputs. So how has this led to improvements in community practice or what do you expect to see? Uh, Esther? Thank you. Um, uh, my organization uh, has been involved in RDA since the beginning, in 2013, and since then we have been really monitoring uh, the outputs, and I should say um, they have been uh, really uh, beneficial to us. Um, they helped us uh, at different levels, um, at the strategic, 
political level, technical level, and community level. Um, they helped us uh, make many informed uh, decisions. Uh, for example, when uh, we decided to um, build an institutional repository, we uh, really uh, based our choices um, of the technical infrastructure uh, on some recommendations uh, uh, that were given by the working groups. For example, uh, regarding uh, the identification of the data, the versioning of the data, um, the citation of the data, etc. And um, we also um, uh, were able to reassess some of our legacy systems and uh, data uh, sets um, and see how we could improve uh, the level of fairness and uh, level of uh, interoperability uh, of our uh, systems and, and data sets. So uh, really, um, I think RDA outputs are really uh, guiding um, for, for us, and, uh, and this is um, really useful at different levels. Um, okay, so, um, so I'd like to start actually by just um, thanking John and the other co-chairs of the working group and everybody else who was involved in the work for, for what they've done. I think it's, um, it's, it's great that they've, they've, um, they've spent the last two years toiling away on our behalf. Um, so, uh, from both a, uh, so from a WDS standpoint, I think um, for us the largest benefit of working with um, RDA, RDA recommendations is really um, you guys in the room, the people listening at home, the 8,000 members of RDA in the 140 countries, it's the, it's the fact that the RDA recommendations are community driven. There's a recognized need within the community. The community experts create a solution. This is community reviewed and community endorsed. And that means when we as WDS go and take it out to our community, it means it's much easier to persuade them that this is something that they probably need and is useful to them. I mean, if if this room and everybody else within RDA doesn't like something, you hear about it. So it's, you know, it's not so a difficult sell in reality. And um, in this case, I mean, it's, it's obvious from everything John said that the, the outputs of the current working group are not yet fully complete. But when they are, and when they're further developed, we, we do expect that they will be adopted by, by the Core Trust Seal. Um, and the Core Trust Seal is from an RDA output and a, a highly successful RDA output, I, I personally would say. So it's going to build on and strengthen that. Um, and I think it's clear to say that the, the, the Core Trust Seal has um, shown definite improvements uh, to the, the, the practices of the, the data repositories community over the, the past two years. Um, the addition of this work, um, as, as John has already kind of um, said, will, will really help assess the, the fairness of data within trustworthy data repositories. Um, the idea of, of fairness was still really in its infancy, I think, when this work was, was going on, was starting, but now we can, we can see the, the momentum that's built, so I think it's, it's great that, that uh, this can be built in. Um, and it's also good that in doing so, it's, it's expected to highlight some of the connections between the concept of a trustworthy data repository and the fairness of the data within that repository, which I think there's some slight confusion within the community at the moment, and it would be nice to help clarify that, I think, with, with, with um, these kind of um, measures. So um, that's, I think I'll leave it there. So, um, thinking about the, um, the impact that the PID Kernel Information um, Working Group, the, the discussions in it, and now the final recommendation has, has had in, in our community, um, I think it's easiest to just think about where we were before all of this work started. So, if I think back to that point, which was about two years ago, with, as with all of the other groups, 
Um, there was a general um, awareness of what you could do with persistent identifiers and the concept of digital objects. Um, there were some, uh, some early services, uh, things were being put in place, um, but, but there was, compared to today, by far not this kind of um, deep understanding of what could be the potential of that and what it really means to, um, to, implement, to implement different services. So particularly these, uh, these principles that the working group has come up with um, have basically put something there for us to, to look towards and say, look, this is, this is something that can guide us, where before there was basically nothing. So we would have, come, have, have had to come up with all of, these, all of these discussions that the group did all by ourselves. And this is by far something we, we shouldn't have done just uh, within our disciplinary standpoint. I think it would have looked much different, not as, not as well thought through if uh, compared to the, uh, to the different perspectives that were uh, represented in the working group. And I also think it helped us um, to have this, uh, this discussion at uh, an organization as RDA with also, also um, some kind of formal backing, also to convince the different stakeholders in the community to invest in something and build new services. Because this is, this is something that, is, uh, that I um, remember particularly discussing with, uh, with um, representatives of users, with uh, representatives of the data infrastructure and saying, look, um, here is something that a group at the RDA has come up with. Um, this is something we can build on top of. And this has clearly made it easier and, and a bit faster just to get um, these new services in place that are now using kernel information. So this is, this is what I think is, is one of the key values of having that formal backing and of having these wide discussions that can only happen in an RDA working group. Excellent, thank you. And I think the clear theme there is around agreement and support and consensus building. And a final question from, from me then. Could you talk about the challenges perhaps that you experienced in adopting RDA outputs? and a final piece of advice you would give to potential adopters. Esther. Um, the challenge is um, for us, um, what we experienced um, were different uh, depending on the level uh, on which we, we wanted to implement the, uh, the recommendations. Uh, at the technical level, um, I can say it's quite easy. Um, but uh, let's say at the community level, it's... Um, <laughs> it's quite slow, let's say, put it like that. Um, it's, it's very slow uh, to uh, bring the researchers um, to um, adopt the best practices. Um, it's, it, it's slow to, um, to um, make them see the value of, um, uh, of adopting and changing sometimes uh, their habits. We try, I think, all the working groups uh, try to um, take into account uh, the, the practices and the habits uh, of um, the scientific community, but um, still uh, adopting the recommendations uh, um, demands some effort, and not everyone is uh, ready to uh, do this effort. So uh, from our experience, uh, Adopting uh, the technical part at an institutional level was quite easy. Adopting uh, the social part, uh, uh, changing the practices at the community level is really hard and, uh, and slow. But um, we uh, try to uh, go step by step um, and find some uh, volunteers um, and champions <laughs> to uh, demonstrate the added value of uh, the recommendations and yeah, the best practices. And I, 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 I can say that um, it's, we, we can see some encouraging uh, results 
uh, starting from last year, we really noticed um, um, more general adoption um, in the community, the scientific community, and this is really uh, encouraging. And yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, basically let me start by saying that it's, it's really quite incredible what is achieved by most uh, RDA working groups in an 18 month time frame. That 18 month time frame they're given, I mean it's, it's the, the, even getting to a, re uh, a recommendation or output in that time is, is phenomenal um, and uh, it's a great achievement. However, we have to remember that in, by and large they are recommendations. One should not expect a complete solution tailored to one's needs. Even something like the, the core trustworthy data repositories requirements and their associated procedures were created and tested with a very highly specific goal and adoption community in mind. But there was, even with that, there was still much to do between the endorsements of the recommendations by the RDA community and actually implementing them in a meaningful way. So I think the, the point I would like to make here is that most working groups are extremely keen, considering they put blood, sweat and tears into two years of work, to ensure that their efforts are actually adopted by the community. And in that regard, I think it's very, very important to work with those who actually developed the recommendation, get advice from them and about how it might be implemented appropriately in the context that you're looking at. Um, and that, that's what I th can't stress that highly enough. So I can only um, repeat what Rory has said about um, RDA recommendation, and in this case, the current information recommendation. This is, this is not an off-the-shelf ready product, right? This is, this is something that we can use, but from, from the recommendation to get to um, particularly operationally running code is something that is I think a challenge for, for our community as well. And I think it's, it's I, I don't say this to, to criticize the work of RDA and of this working group in some form, it's just what you can expect from such a diverse 18 month time frame in which you do innovative work, but it would be also unrealistic to expect such, such an off the shelf product that you could just plug in and it works. So there is still this gap of going from the recommendation to actually, what does it mean in our community? Oh, we have to adopt different services. Oh, what, well, just saying there are many details in there that we discovered that we had to solve, that we had to have lengthy discussions on, and so on. And in the end, and um, this, is, uh, this is something that uh, sort of, uh, is a, is a point on the 18 month time frame again. Um, in the end, the full adoption of the recommendation will still take a bit more time. So what we have now is, yes, we've put this to operational services, um, but there's always a spectrum. So we also have something new coming up where we see, okay, we can go a bit further in, in our adoption. We can, we can really go again back to the recommendation and see, okay, yeah, there are things, um, yeah, there, there are good things that we could also do that are in the recommendation that we have not done yet because they are either too hard to do so far in the operational uh, services or um, there was no use case for them now, but there is for them in the future possibly. So those, those kinds of work, that will still take a bit of time and possibly also again one, two, three more years and we will see further eff effect um, out of the recommendation. And the other point there that's, that's a bit related is um, that some of the things that are in the recommendation are um, not useful uh, to do just at a simple uh, disciplinary community level or in a disciplinary infrastructure. Some of them spread beyond our infrastructure. And this is, this is something, again, where we come back to the point of collaboration, where I think collaboration, not just in RDA on the uh, writing these recommendations and working out the details is important, but also um, collaboration at the level of doing things in the code, testing things, rolling them out. 
This is something that I think is also a challenge, not for our community, but in general, but I think it can be solved through collaborative work. Excellent, thank you. We'll maybe take five or 10 minutes. I think we can take uh, two or three questions if there are some from the, from the floor. Please feel free to come up to a mic and ask anything of our adopters and co-chairs. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Leslie, maybe. <laughs> All right, don't hate me for this. Okay, one of the things we know and that we get from the adoption is sometimes they don't work out for the purpose that you think they're going to or what you had in mind. Have any of you encountered that? And if you have, do you feed that back to RDA to say, you know, this was great, what, what, I, what we thought we would need, it's not what we need, um, and here's why. Here's what I thought it would do. And it doesn't have to be on one of the ones that, that you just spoke about. Anyone like to take that? I know. <laughs> This may, be a, this may be a miss, but it's something actually I've talked to Rory about with regard to the core trust seal requirements. Um, so it's not that we, we, we uh, I run a, I'm at Virginia Tech and running an institutional repository. So the, uh, that's a repository that takes all comers, all data formats, all uh, disciplinary data. And we've run, run this, uh, use the core trust seal requirements as an internal assessment for our repository. You know, not doing it as a certification, but how well is our repository doing and what is it, where does it need to improve? And something that I learned as I was doing this was they have this concept in Cordial Seal land called designated community, that the repository is for some particular designated community. Well, that doesn't quite fit with an institutional repository. So I, something I learned as I was going through it. Now, is this, has this something I've passed off to RDA? The answer is no. I've, I've talked to Rory about it, and actually something that maybe we'll talk about in the future about how the certification process might be expanded to generalist repositories. But, uh, it's, it, it, we, we spent a long time, a little while, trying to figure out how are we going to respond to these questions? Are they applicable to our repository? What should we do? Let me just add, uh, not really add, but let me add a tangential point there. But, but if I'm not mistaken, recommendations are not living documents. So if there is a maturation that comes, it comes in the form of a new recommendation. But, but the people that work on RDA would, could, could comment on that. We can, Anthony? Oh, yeah. uh, so, you can create like a maintenance stage in the... In Mike, the, uh, 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 Thank you. Uh, yes, from my understanding it is that it goes through an approval process given uh, a unique identifier is now a, 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 a relative, uh, uh, complete uh, finalized object, but uh, or, or recommendation or output. But then a working group, which I, I you, I've I've heard reiterated multiple times, uh, working groups uh, maintain an, uh, a connection with their adopters, and 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 the hope would be to increase that feedback so it's not a purely stagnant uh, 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 object or a purely stagnant recommendation. But we can see how it, it is changing in its adaptation, both across domains or as its growth over over time. That would that would be. Uh, I, I think very, very important, yeah. Um, maybe I can add a sort of connected point. Um, so going back to what John was saying, I mean, it's not, um, we're not certainly not going to change the quarter seal specifically in that regard. We might need to, we're, we're, we're looking at other ways of bringing in um, more general repositories and what have you, but in connection with the point of updating things, I would like to announce to the audience now that that um, we are undergoing currently a review of the core trust seal. So uh, not only the requirements, but all the guidance, all the extended guidance, the procedures that we're going through. Now, we're not doing that per se through RDA. Obviously, we're, we're saying to the RDA community, please comment, and I'm saying to you now, please comment, so you can 
Um, you can either look at the, the posting that is on the, the interest group, the certification interest group, or you can go directly to the, the Core Trust Seal website. But either way, we are conducting that at the moment, and I'm assuming at the end of that, we probably will come back and talk to you guys about versioning our uh, new, new uh, documentation. But, uh, yeah. So, so one, one point I'd like to make maybe on, on this unique connection that uh, Rory and John can speak to is you had one existing output, which was the core trust seal recommendations. Now you have a new output that's in development and undergoing testing that could be an, an extension and alignment with an existing output. So you have, in a sense, two working groups that are collaborating together and growing something new. What what? What in your in your experience were were some of the the, the benefits in, in that within both the the RDA community provides for such an experience, but then w how did that look or what was the the benefit to to using existing output as kind of a, a, a foundation and also uh, growing it in alignment with a, a, a new output that's in development? Um, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose, I suppose as much as anything else from, from, from our standpoint is kind of saying there's, there's a, a high level of institutional knowledge already here. So it's, it's, it's basically, it, it, you're not starting from scratch again talking to a new audience. You're talking with the same people who know what has gone before and you, that makes it very easy. To, to continue that work, to build on that work. And sort of going back to slightly to, to Leslie's point, I don't think that the, we've ever been in a position where we've, tr we've adopted something and been disappointed or uh, unsure that it did what we thought it would do. I think it's been more the case that maybe there needed to be a little bit more maturation of what that output was before it was in a position, you know, we, it, the 18 months as, as, as timeline has come to an end, some really good work has come out of it. Has that work reached exactly what we were hoping it might have reached? Not necessarily, and that's probably because it was too ambitious for an 18 month time frame, and that's why these extensions happen, why these new working groups come out of previous working groups. Okay, I think we can maybe take one quick question. We have either Kevin or uh, yes. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, <laughs> try to make it quick. Um, I'm a latecomer uh, career-wise to RDA, I would say, and, and that may be why I'm arguably a bit of an RDA non-adopter. Um, in that, I think maybe a lot of the recommendations are seem purpose-specific to me rather than something I can use. I've sort of been there on some of those. I'd like to hear, especially from the adopters, but also um, uh, from the creators of these recommendations, if you have an idea uh, how you uh, figured out which recommendations are the right ones and which aren't, and whether there is a good way to make more of the recommendations immediately useful. Where, where do you run into a obstacle where you say, I can't use that. There, that easy one to finish off one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's also one of the key topics of the boffs that we have in uh, progress the next two days. So that would be an excellent time to take that discussion further. <laughs> so any thoughts for now or no? Okay, at that point, I think I'll hand back to Anthony for some final wrap up and, and, uh, <laughs> and action points. Um, but for those with upcoming recommendations, do keep an eye out for those recommendations. And as has been um, described already, do connect with those working group co-chairs. Hopefully this has given you some insights into the adoption um, process and, and how outputs are created and used. And um, hopefully you can learn from those adoption experiences um, Anthony. So I'm not going to keep you from food or alcohol or, or conversating anymore. would love to work with you on. Um, so that is one of the main things that I myself am interested in. How can, how can we improve packaging things to make them more intelligible um, and, and make them easier to adopt? There's a boff 
as, as, as Daniel mentioned, devoted especially to that. There's some work underway uh, that has been uh, going on for a while uh, to, to improve the metadata documentation around things, improving some kind of structured documentation that needs to be associated with each, with each output. Please do attend if you're interested. Um, uh, that's their names in the program. Uh, if you're interested in that question of how to make them easier to adopt or more intelligible for different audiences, please come to the Making RDA Outputs and Recommendations Easier to Adopt session. If you're more interested in how to collect, monitor, track, uh, and repackage adoption stories or submit your own adoption story or what you want to see within adoption stories, please come to the Enhanced Dissemination of Adoption Stories session. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback. There's the, it, it, there are some formal structures to, to, the, to the boss, but we would love to hear some of your in, uh, in, input and insights there. Um, I'm going to go back if that's possible. Yes. Um, so uh, I mentioned adoption stories. If you have some, uh, there is a link on our website, which I'll send you to. But uh, in addition, we're uh, the code data uh, call for publications uh, is interested in hearing about uh, RDA adoption stories and implementation and testing of RDA outputs and recommendations, please do feel free to submit those there as well. But then uh, follow this link. Uh, this will have everything that you might be interested in learning more about adoption. So you can read existing adoption stories. You can submit your own using a structured web form. We can then take that information and clean it up and structure it in a more standardized way with all adoption stories. Uh, in addition, you'll find a poll, which uh, I really please do ask you to participate in, if you're willing, that really is kind of assessing what are your needs, what do you want to see within adoption stories, what do you want to see in outputs to make them easier. Um, please do feel free to take that, uh, that poll if you have time. Um, and there's some other resources there, and that'll, that'll be a link that'll get you uh, everything that you like. Um, and at that point, there is, yes, there is a video as well. Um, so there's a quick video um, that kind of outlines our strategy. I, we wanted to show it today, but I think um, you can tell there's a lot fit into one time. Uh, so uh, there's a video as well that you can share uh, with your friends, colleagues, uh, Twitter. Um, it's a quick overview of, of, of what we're doing as a strategy and, and what we're doing within Secretariat. So please do take a look at that as well for another mode of, of interacting and another medium of expressing these ideas. Um, is that all? All right, and you're, please uh, uh, you now move to posters and food and drink, and, and I think we're done. Thank you.